So um, in my city, there's a uh, there's a group called the City Repair Project. They kind of branched off into other cities since then. Um, but you know, basically what they what they do is they go to different street corners and just create make an art project out of it. They just paint the street corners and you know, all kinds of cool designs and. and um, Sometimes they add sculpture to it, and um, you know, I first heard about it and I thought, well, it's kind of, it's kind of neat. You know, obviously, I like I like you know having a city that's good to look at, but um, I didn't quite get what, what the deeper meaning behind that was uh, until I saw the uh, founder of this group um, give a speech, and um, I, I was kind of blown away by uh, sort of the vision behind this. Um, first of all, it, it was interesting for me to know that uh, that they started doing this illegally. I mean, they, they, when they first did, they didn't have permits for. They just went out to the street corners and decorated the place, and you know, and then, and then um, uh, people and, and people started enjoying their their streets. People slowed down when they're driving through these neighborhoods. They, uh, you know, there's a lot more people hanging out around the street corners and became like a, uh, a sort of public space for people to uh, uh, to meet the neighbors and chat chit chat with, um, and um, you know, of course. The, the city kind of saw the value of this and started, um, you know, you know, started sponsoring it, giving them permits and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, it, when, when I um, saw the speech, he, he was he was talking about how, in a sense, uh, th this project was kind of a critique of modern urbanism. Um, he talked about the Roman grid, uh, which is how city how how cities are laid out these days, which is. You know, in, in ancient Romans, you know, when they're going to the new, ter when they're conquering new territory, they would, uh, you know, build new cities, and it'd just be this, uh, you know, Cartesian grid of, you know, the horizontal and vertical streets, and all you know, just all these squares, and you know, there'd be a temple here and a marketplace here and a city hall here, you know, so they all look the same. So I mean, that's a, that's a good thing to have if you're a military power and you need to move around quickly. Um, but it lacks a certain human quality to it. And if you go to like medieval cities, um, a lot of them were kind of uh, sprouted up spontaneously. And there is a kind of order to them. You know, there, there's, there are, the streets do go into these certain nooks and crannies in, in a way that, but it, but it, but it's a kind of spontaneous order in a kind of, it, 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 there's something more organic about it that makes it difficult to navigate if you if you're not from there. But um, there, uh, but there's a kind of human quality to that. And in these streets, you know, they uh, they would be crowded with uh, you know, merchants and you know, and and people go, people going through going through the streets and bartering. And you know, there, there was these places. These streets were made as kind of public spaces. Where people could gather around and and chat and uh, socialize and stuff and and um, and there was this idea of called you know what's called a town square or it would be kind of a meeting place so it's sort of an agora for for, for everyone um, and the the guy behind it said that was kind of what he was trying to kind of recreate was create these public spaces um, you know bring back uh, sort of the public sphere to our our society and uh, the uh, the way that our cities are designed now is very prohibitive of that kind of open socialization, um, and you know so instead people like go to bars and uh, clubs and they go into that. To, but um, anyway, I mean I think I guess you know what I want to drop in this is. Uh, what what I see is actually kind of the virtue of the market, which is, which is spontaneity. There, there's a kind of um, when you try to control something too closely, um, you tend to what you end up sacrificing is novelty. Uh, now, novelty doesn't always necessarily have to be good. I mean, sometimes uh, I, I think, for example, in in the in the last financial this last financial crisis. There was way too much financial innovation. I think you know, the financial markets could be a little bit less creative and novel, but um, but you know I, I, there. But you know, take an example of novelty. Could you have predicted Facebook thirty years ago? You, you know, I mean, 
it, it presupposes a set of, you know, the World Wide Web, that, which didn't have been, exist back then. I mean, those ARPANET, which was a military uh, system that was a precursor to the Internet. You know, and you know, when the Internet first, was first created, it wasn't, you know, the idea of social networking didn't, didn't exist. So, um, uh, so, you know, the, there's there's a certain to, to which you can't uh, you can't plan for things like that you you, know, you can't plan for a fa for Facebook or YouTube or anything like that that's just the kind of uh, spontaneous thing that comes through human collaboration um, and, and and that's a virtue I what well, just something I like about uh, the Austrian school of, of economics I, I've been pretty hard on the Austrian school in a lot of ways uh, I, th I think that they're they are kind of market fundamentalists uh, in, um, and put too much um, faith in the, in the invisible hand. But one thing I, I do like about them versus like mainstream schools like the, the, the Chicago School, for instance, um, is you know mainstream economics thinks in terms of equilibrium. You know that the market, you know, some some exogenous force might un, might shake up the market, but it will settle down towards a certain equilibrium, and yeah, uh, you know, there's for the, for the market is efficient, and uh, that that's just simply false. And um, in, in our experience with financial markets, should you know prove that it's false, but um, you know what what uh the the Austrian school does is they say, "Oh yeah, the market is dynamic, and, that, and that's what's great about it is that, uh, you know, the entrepreneurs can you know can find these dis disequilibriums in the market and uh, and exploit them to create uh, these new uh, to create these new no uh, novelties that that enrich our lives and and you know, things uh, you know, and bring about great great innovation." Um, and yeah, I, I can agree with them. And they they tend the problem is they tend to use that argument to say that you know there should be like no government control of the economy whatsoever, you know, other than you know, having this sort of night watchman state to make sure that no one kills each other. Um, but I but I think there's ways you can have like controlled chaos, um, where you kind of create these attractor points in the dynamic system around which it they create novelty and around which they evolve. Um, and I, I, a great example I think that's kind of caught on recently is uh, permaculture. You, you know, agriculture is uh, you know when it was first created, and, and people start, especially when people have like like grow grow um, their, their fruits and vegetables and eat these like row these neat little rows where they can sprinkle them all. Yeah, that's very um, command economy like. Yeah, that, that that's kind of yeah, and, and they use monoculture and. Uh, it's it's a it's a very controlled thing. It, it works obviously, and we've been doing it for a long time. But I and mean, of course we have to keep using new fertilizers and uh, pesticides, stuff like that. Uh, but you know, permaculture is, is saying you know instead of trying to engineer all this stuff, instead of what what we'll what we'll do is actually try to grow an ecosystem, and uh, you know figure out the sort of dynamics of the system and. Um, create sort of parameters in which that system can manifest itself, and and I think I'd like I'd kind of like to see that same idea applied to you know economic planning. Um, and so I guess th this video is in part um, inspired by uh, Piro's exchange with Heifel Day about social security, and um, Piro's idea I guess was missing some sort of subsidies and price controls with social security to make sure that. Um, you know that the uh, you know, that the certain essentials have a stable price, you know, because he, he's saying you know don't have a you know, they're on a fixed income you don't uh, so you need a fixed economy for that. Um, well, I guess my idea is I don't think there, sh there should be a fixed income. I think that uh, the social security should grow the economy. And again, I I hate to do this, but I, I have to resort back to. Henry George and land value taxation again, because that's uh, um, because land values grow with the economy. That you know they adjust for inflation. In fact, they soak up inflation, so that there's less inflation to begin with. Um, and uh, and they also grow with population. So 
basically, uh, you know, if, if you had a fixed percentage of the revenue from land values going into Social Security, then you have a growing a system that grows with the population and with the economy, so that um, so that it, it adjusts itself, and you don't have to try to figure out all these little um, you know acupuncture points in the system. I mean, it, it's it sort of you don't ha you don't have to keep adjusting these parameters and, and stuff. You, it just it sort of adjusts itself in the dynamic system. Um, so. Uh, so I mean, given that system, I, I mean, you could still have the subsidies and price controls, but my my question is why? You know, um, so you know, it, it's kind it's kind of I mean, I, you know, interesting in, in uh, among Georgists, there's a debate over this idea called the citizen's dividend, which is uh, you know, you take you take a certain portion of the total revenue and just Distribute, distribute it among all the citizens as a sort of um, guaranteed minimum income, so that everyone gets a certain percentage each month. Um, and I, yeah, I've kind of gone back and forth on that idea. I think it has, it has certain um, advantages, but you know, I'm still not completely sold on it. But what I do think would be interesting is use a portion of it, just give it to uh, you know the retirees, and then instead of you know worrying about Social Security going bankrupt and Having to raise the retirement age to sixty-seven, you could lower it to like fifty, and you know people get to live out half their lives, uh, you know, free from any work. And I think that'd be a beautiful, beautiful system. Um, so you know, I, I guess I guess what I'm getting is I find myself going in a little bit more libertarian direction lately, even even if I'm not like completely um, completely sold in it. Um, I am sort of in awe of the market in its uh, capacity for spontaneity and, and novelty. Um, you know, but I, but I also believe that you know controls are possible. It's just um, you have to find those little pressure points where you can um, cre where you can um, allow it to organize around some central um, control. And and so I I kind of wish that economic planning would. Um, would evolve in that in that sort of way that that you uh, allow for as much spontaneity and novelty as possible uh, while still working for the desired outcome. So um, I guess that's it for now. Peace.